Between 1992 and 1994, nine young black women in Charlotte, North Carolina, were raped and strangled to death, their murders increasing in ferocity and frequency. For almost two years, the killer remained at large, causing what led to an angry hysteria in the city, especially within the predominantly minority community where the murders were occurring. Observed was a lack of adequate police patrolling in that area of town. However, the real reason that the murderer continued to run rampant was because the police were simply stumped. Henry Louis Wallace is an American serial killer who killed a total of 11 black women in South Carolina and North Carolina from March of 1990 to March of 1994. He is currently awaiting execution at Central Prison in Raleigh, North Carolina. This is the story. Henry Wallace was born in Barnwell, South Carolina on November 4, 1965, the son of Lolly Mae Wallace. Henry was raised by his mother who worked long hours as a textile worker. According to various accounts, she abused Henry physically and psychologically, often being verbally abusive, criticizing Henry for even the smallest mistakes. His mother grew up disappointed by life as her own mother died at a young age and her father deserted her and her siblings shortly after. Lottie's resentment of life did not improve when she gave birth out of wedlock to two children, first Henry's sister Yvonne, then Henry by a married high school teacher who then returned to his wife. Aside from a lack of emotional comfort, the tumble-down house in which Henry Wallace grew up had neither electricity nor plumbing. The Wallaces drank from a pump well and their bathroom was really a watershed with a set of chamber pots. Household members included young Henry, his sister Yvonne, who was three years older, the children's mother and great-grandmother. Tensions ran high inside of the home with Henry's mother and his great-grandmother. The pair did not get along, and they argued incessantly. Now, to get a picture of how things were between Henry and the adult women in the house, Let's go back to when Henry was a toddler and was being potty trained. Now, normally this would be a time of learning for both the parent and child. It can be frustrating as well, but it's generally a time that is remembered as a milestone for the child. And it's very important in their development. Well, for Henry, potty training was his first knowledge of hell. As a toddler, if he had an accident in his pants, he was berated. The chastisement instilled Henry with such terror that he would often just go in his pants and then try to hide the mistake by concealing the wet pants. Now, because Lottie was the sole provider in the household and had to work long days to pay the bills, she demanded that the children grow up quickly. But sometimes her discipline was severe. When she thought either of the two children needed to be punished, she would make them pick their own switch from a tree by which to be spanked. If she was tired after a day's work, she ordered brother and sister to whip each other. For Henry, this was painful, and he hated to have to hurt his sister. To him, it was worse than being on the receiving end of the switch. Now, Henry hated whipping his sister, but he never argued with his mother about this matter or any other matter, even when he was forced to wear his sister's hand-me-downs or empty out the family's chamber pots, which were the pots filled with the family's waste. Henry never argued. Instead, he yearned to be like his friends at John F. Myers Elementary School, where he was a student. Kids there had dads with whom to play stickball and fly kites, but Henry had no dad. When he once asked his mom about his natural father, who was he, where did he go, Lolly told him to quit asking silly questions. But something happened when Henry was in the sixth grade that would psychologically scar him forever. His father called on the phone out of nowhere. He introduced himself and told Henry he had always wanted to meet him and he promised to stop by and meet him that week. Henry was thrilled and wondered what his father looked like and how the two would feel when they first saw each other. Would his father like him? The next morning, Henry woke up early and stayed home from school so that he would be sure to be there when his father arrived. Since he did not know the exact time, 
he was set to arrive. Henry watched from his mother's bedroom window. He watched every car that turned that corner, but his father did not show up that day. The following day, Henry did the same thing. Still, his father was a no-show. The day after that, still no father in sight. And as you can expect, Henry's father never appeared. That memory pained Henry day and night for many years to come. Henry began high school in 1979. He attended Barnwell High School, where he was said to have been a somewhat mediocre student. He got good grades, served on the student council, and was well-liked by other students. Teachers thought Henry to be an obedient boy. Now, because his mother forbade him to join the football team, he did the next best thing. He joined the cheerleading squad and was the only male on the roster. Standing six feet tall, Henry towered over his female counterparts, as you can imagine. But instead of inciting jeers, Henry won admiration from the students and school staff alike for his enthusiasm and creativity. The girl cheerleaders adored him for his politeness and upbeat attitude. After graduating from Barnwell High in May of 1983, Henry made a feeble attempt to pursue higher education. He attended South Carolina State College for a semester, then Denmark Technical College for another. He fell from them both, not from the lack of ability, but out of drive. He expended more interest in his evening job as a DJ at a small local radio station than putting energy into school. He fashioned himself as a Wolfman Jack prototype and even tagged himself as the Knight Rider. Now, considering what was to come from Henry Wallace, was this nickname just an eerie coincidence? Now, on the air, listeners enjoyed Henry's humor, his easygoing manner. Females liked his voice, and it may have been the roots of a career for Henry were he not fired after a short time, caught in the act of stealing CDs. His college plans awash, his future in hiatus, his life basically in shambles. Henry joined the U.S. Naval Reserve in December of 1984. He would remain in the Navy for eight years. Now in the Navy, Henry excelled. He was described as an outstanding seaman who willingly followed all orders given to him and accomplished his assigned tasks in a timely manner. It was noted that his knowledge level was higher than expected of a seaman, and he was eventually promoted to third-class petty officer. Before he left the service, his achievement ranking was nearly perfect. While a sailor, Henry married Moretta Brabham, a girl he had seen on and off since his sophomore year at Barnwell High School. Prior to their wedding, Moretta had had a child with another man, but Henry opened his arms to the little girl, raising her as his own. Wife and child followed Henry as he was transferred to the West Coast and back again, but the marriage turned out to be a disappointment. Henry had adopted Moretta's child, and he wanted one of his own, but his wife refused to have any more children. Now, this caused a strain on their marriage. Furthermore, as the relationship went on, their sex life diminished as well. Henry blamed Moretta's frigidness on the fact that she had been raped as a teenager. Now, when he suggested that they attend a counseling session, she blew up. And the year 1992 was the beginning of the end for their marriage as well as Henry himself. In August of that year, he was apprehended in a breaking and entry near the naval base and was asked to leave the military. Now, because of his until then unblemished record, the Navy permitted him to exit on an honorable discharge. Immediately after he re-entered into civilian life, Moretta left him. Unemployed and heartbroken, Henry moved back in with his mom and sister, who now were living near Charlotte, North Carolina. Now, during this time, Henry dated other girls, but he still wanted to be with his wife, Moretta. He then got one of the women that he was seeing pregnant, and even though their relationship did not last, he became a father when a beautiful baby girl was born in September of 1993. 
Now, despite Henry's oncoming mania and downfall, the child Kendra Urilla remained the treasure of his life and the only enduring bright spot that he had ever known. But his failures were mowing him down. Having experimented with drugs at an earlier age, he now was turning to them for an escape from memories of Moretta, whom he still loved, and from his reality. And as Henry's anxiety increased, so did the drug habits. Jobs he took never lasted because he just didn't care about them or anything. Now, there had been a devil twitching inside of him. It was whispering bad recollections and unfulfilled dreams. And at last, Henry Louis Wallace finally gave in to that devil to create a piece of hell on earth for nine Charlotte area women and their families and for himself as well. In 1994, Charlotte, North Carolina earned recognition as the third largest banking center in the United States. It was also noted as the sixth largest wholesale center with 11 billion in retail sales. Nearly 14,000 new jobs have been created and because of this, Charlotte was ranking eighth on a list of American cities that was destined to reach zenith economic growth over the next decade. And Charlotte has done that. We all have seen the growth in Charlotte, North Carolina. Now their urban culture also was coexisting well with little friction. So they people were proud of Charlotte, North Carolina. But Charlotte was also having troubles. The Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department, like many big cities, their law enforcement bureaus were operating on a shoestring budget. They simply did not have the funds. The department's efforts in fighting crime consisted of various programs that honed in on the city's major problems. They worked with other departments and agencies to fight crime. Now, although the police force was stretched thin and they were working with other departments, they actually were winning their war on crime. However, from 1992 to 1994, they had their hands full and elusive someone started preying on young women in East Charlotte, raping them, strangling them, and sometimes stabbing them to death. The strangulation murders, as they became known, took center stage. As the volume of killings grew, Charlotte's alarm rose steadily along with them. Now, what would become a 22-month killing spree of nine murders attached to the same suspect began slowly. The first three happen over a year's time. Now, the police did not anticipate a serial killer or the avalanche of public dismay that would come when the killer's rage eventually began to escalate. Now, the first of the nine killings would not even be labeled as a murder. In fact, for many months to come, no corpse had been found. Thus, victim number one was filed as a missing person. And victim number one was Caroline Love. This killing spree began undetected on June 19th of 1992. The manager of Bojangles Restaurant on Central Avenue contacted Kathy Love to tell her that her sister Caroline had not reported to work in a couple of days. Now he asked her to please go and check on her sister's condition. So Kathy alerted, she rushed over to Caroline's apartment. Not finding anything amiss, no evidence of foul play, she left a note relaying her boss's concerns and her own concerns and left. Now contacting Caroline's roommate, Sadie McKnight, she asked her, where was her friend? Now, Sadie expressed that she too had become suspicious because it was not like Caroline to remain unreachable for more than 48 hours, even if she was staying with friends. So together, Kathy Love and Sadie McKnight took their suspicions to the police. Now, investigator Anthony Rice questioned the Bojangles manager and learned that the last time he had seen Caroline was when she left work on the evening of the 15th. She asked if she could trade a $10 bill for a roll of quarters so she could do a load of laundry when she got home. Now, her cousin Robert Ross who drove her back to her place that night, said that he saw her go into her foyer and that she had seemed neither sidetracked nor nervous. In searching the apartment, the police became suspicious 
it bore appearances of a scuffle. Now, the furniture seemed to be slightly repositioned as if shoved aside during a fight. Curiously, the sheets from Caroline's bed were also removed and were not in the laundry hamper, which was full. So that was suspicious. Now, the investigator determined that Caroline had never done her laundry as she had planned. And the roll of quarters she purchased from her workplace was not in the apartment. Charlotte police continued to search for Caroline Love, but every lead met them with a dead end. She was filed missing and became one of the many case cards of runaways whose fate remained a mystery. Her body would not be discovered for nearly two years. Victim number two, Shauna Hawk. Eight months later, on February 19, 1993, Mrs. Sylvia Sumter came home from work prepared to make dinner for herself and her teenage daughter, Shauna Hawk. Sylvia wondered where her daughter was. She should have been home much, much earlier from her morning commute from Piedmont Central Community College. Now, Sylvia couldn't figure out why Shauna's coat and purse lay unattended in the dining room. Shauna never went anywhere without that purse, and surely she would not have forgotten her coat during the winter months. Placing a call to Daryl Kirkpatrick, Shauna's boyfriend, Sylvia learned that he hadn't seen Shauna all day. Sylvia then called the local Taco Bell, where Shauna worked part-time, to see if Shauna had been called in. But the counter clerk, told her that she was not listed on the evening schedule. Sylvia began to panic, especially when relatives called asking why Shauna had not picked up her godson at school as was her normal routine. Shauna's boyfriend receiving another call from Sylvia jumped in his car and ran to their house to calm the mother down and help her find Shauna rummaging through the house hoping to find a clue as to where Shauna might have gone Daryl wandered into the downstairs bathroom there he noticed that the carpeting was soaking wet and that the shower curtain was not tucked in place through the translucency of the curtain he thought he could see something or someone crouching below the wall of the tub Yanking the curtain back, he screamed. Shauna lay naked in a tub full of water. Her head was sunken below the surface. Her eyes were staring lifelessly upwards. Shauna Hogg was pronounced dead at the hospital. Her skull had suffered lacerations and bruising caused by a blow from a dull and heavy object. However, while that object may have dealt unconsciousness it had not killed her the examining doctor diagnosed that she had been strangled to death a forensic pathologist performed Shauna's autopsy and noted hemorrhaging in the lining of her eyes her face her lips and across her voice box all trademarks of ligature strangulation the hospital labeled her death as a homicide and police were called in Co-workers, friends, classmates, all were interviewed, but the police failed to identify a suspect or a motive. Victim number three, Audrey Spain. Audrey Spain, 24 years old, was a dependable employee. So when she failed to show up two nights in a row to work on June 23rd and 24th, her manager at the Taco Bell knew that something was wrong. He called her, but he got only her answer machine. And then he tried calling her sister and got the same results. So two times failing, not being able to reach the sister or Audrey, he decided to go by Audrey's apartment building to check things out for himself. When he got there, Audrey's car was in the parking lot so he entered the building and knocked on the door that according to the designated mailbox was Audrey's there was no answer despite knocking several times so he left and waited into the morning so in the morning still not able to get a hold of Audrey or the sister he places a call into the girl's janitor at the apartment building so this time he was able to reach someone reaching the janitor he goes over to the apartment and they enter into Audrey Spain's apartment his eyes immediately fell on the open doorway at what looked like a naked woman that was sprawled across the bedroom 
on the bed. Now, edging closer, he knew that that woman laying on the bed was Audrey. He said that, you know, when they used to cross paths, she was always smiling. She was always laughing. But this time she just lay sprawled out as if frozen. Her face was distorted. Her eyes were bulging out. Her entire body just lay there in the throes of anguish as if she died in a violent struggle. Now around her neck were articles of clothing, what looked like a t-shirt and a bra. They were tied together and knotted around her Adam's apple to cut off her airways. Medical examiners concurred that she had been both strangled and raped. Caroline Love, Shauna Hawk, Audrey Spain, and one missing person. Two nearly identical strangulations, months apart. Unfortunately, these crimes were committed and no witnesses had come forth to report suspicious persons hanging around any of these crime scenes. So at this time, no one had seen the same green Nissan Maxima park near these crime scenes. No one was yet able to piece the events together into one ultimately important clue that each of the victims knew the same man. As yet, neither the police nor the newspapers detected a serial killer. So life went on and the investigations of the three unfortunate women faded away as police were forced to take on other crimes occurring across Charlotte in the heat of another summer. FBI profilers agreed that the man whom the Charlotte Observer began to call the Charlotte Strangler did not fit the niche of a serial killer image. Now, the killer's modus operandi did not follow a set pattern, so they had no clue who they were looking for, where they were looking, they were stumped. Victim number four, Valencia Jumper. Now, Valencia was an ambitious 19-year-old college student. She had recently relocated from Columbia, South Carolina, and she was working at Food Lion Grocery Store as well as a clothing shop to help pay for her college tuition. So in August of 93, the same man who had already killed Hawk, Love, and Spain snuffed out Valencia, but her murder was actually set up different. It was different from all of the other killings and the detectives missed the link. Now on the night of August 9th, a visiting boyfriend, Zachary Douglas, smelled something burning as he got closer to Valencia's apartment. He then saw that there was smoke coming from underneath the threshold of the door. Now the door was locked, so he had to get a neighbor who called the fire department and they were there in minutes and they bust down the door. Once the fire department got into the unit, they saw that a fire had been started from something that was left on the stove. It was a pot or something of that nature that was lit over a gas burner. Now, the flames had reached a connecting bedroom where it appeared that Valencia had fallen asleep on her bed. She was severely burned, but the next day, the coroner examined her body and they concluded that the girl had died of thermal burns. It would not be until the Charlotte Strangler was apprehended and that he actually confessed to Valencia's murder that her remains would be reassessed. And after the latter examination, the coroner amended his earlier findings, changing her cause of death to strangulation. Victim number five, Michelle Stinson. The next victim, Michelle Stinson, met her death on September 15th, five weeks after Valencia Jumper's death in a manner not matching Valencia, and it was with a major variation from the other murdered females. While strangled, she was also stabbed. The murder weapon was an ordinary kitchen knife, and it had been shoved through her back. Her body was found in the kitchen by her two young sons, one three and one one years old, who had neither seen nor heard the assailant. Now, when the older child ran to a house that was nearby to tell the friend that his mother was, quote, sleeping on the floor, the boy hurried over to discover that Michelle was lying cold in a pool of blood. Her telephone had been ripped from the wall. An autopsy revealed that the blade had penetrated the upper left side of her back below her shoulder blade and had caused mortal wounds to her heart and lungs. Now, Michelle had also been raped and then strangled with a ligature. This time, the strangling occurred after she had died from the knife wounds and while she lay dying and comatose.
As the police continue to question relatives and friends, neighbors and co of the murdered women, they were drawing big time blanks. Although the killings were starting to appear as maybe the handiwork of one man who was getting a kick out of strangling and raping women, and even though they all took place within a five mile radius of East Charlotte, their diversity made it impossible to pinpoint any identifying traits beyond the strangulation. But the black population in whose area these homicides were occurring, they were beginning to get irritated. The citizens were interpreting the police department's no-show results as something else, something one-sided. Even the local newspapers had been low-key. In fact, most of the earlier deaths had gone unreported. Under fire was a perceived lackadaisical attitude by the politicians and law enforcers who claimed that some were ignoring the problems among the total black population. So East Charlotte, it was known as a busy urban area. It was hardworking people, mostly black people, but they did have a checkerboard of other races, but it was a middle-class neighborhood. You can picture a neighborhood that has strip malls, shopping centers, storefront businesses, fast food chains, movie theaters, small mom and pop shops that are on the major avenues. It's the kind of neighborhood where people, they walk around, you know, they take a stroll, the kids walk to school, women window browse. It's a place where people don't want to think that they have a strangler watching them or watching the kids, watching the wives and the girlfriends that are light shopping around the neighborhood. Many in the neighborhood refused to understand why the police could not match fingerprints that they found at the crime scenes up against any fingerprints that they may have had on file. They also couldn't understand how an obviously male strangler and rapist could just slip past supposed dragnets time after time again. So in defense, City Hall vowed that they were going to do something about it, okay? They were going to do the best that they could, the best that the city's patrolmen were able to do, okay? They, they started working night and day to solve the rash of murders, and the patrol cars were stopping any and all suspicious characters. At an emergency press conference, the police department committed to results and assured the people that investigations would continue. Now, at this time, homicide detective Sergeant Gary McFadden had been appointed the lead investigator. Now, although he had not previously been assigned to this strangler case, his excellent record had earned him the lead position. So he was suddenly faced with this task of being the spokesman and mediator between the police and the public. It was now up to him to explain why these murders had not been solved. A black man himself, McFadden found no understanding ear from his own people. The community hated him. They did not understand why he couldn't get the job done. But McFadden, he was professional and he did his job. He spoke with each of the affected families personally and he expressed his sympathy as well as his determination to bring their loved one's murderer to justice. Now, throughout the fall of 1993, things were quiet. After Michelle Stinton's murder in mid-September, the remainder of the year into the past Christmas holidays passed without another event. Now, because of the pressure put on the police, they increased their patrols in the community, and now that things grew to a calm, they were wondering if they had scared off the killer or killers. Okay, then the police department at this point, they were still unsure if they were dealing with unrelated criminals or with an individual strangler. Now, incident-free, nevertheless, both McFadden and the people that he were serving, they felt an uneasy pause as the holidays passed. Now, their apprehension proved not to be unwarranted because there was another victim. Victim number six, Vanessa Mack. On Sunday, February 20th, 1994, Vanessa Mack's mother, Barbara, came to pick up her grandchild as she did every Sunday so that Vanessa could go to her job at the Carolinas Medical Center. Barbara had arrived a little earlier than usual that day as it wasn't quite the appointed 6 a.m. Now, Barbara was surprised to find that the door was open. Assuming that her daughter and granddaughter were just inside, she called out to them, expecting Vanessa to answer her back come in mom but no one answered her 
stepping into the foyer, Barbara knew that something was wrong because Vanessa's four-month-old child was asleep on the sofa, still in her play clothes from the day before. But Vanessa was nowhere to be seen. She was not in the kitchen, not in the bathroom, not in the bedroom. But when Barbara did a double take and looked at the bed, she realized that the gray bundle of covers was not a bundle at all, but it was her daughter thrown partially dressed in a misshapen position across the mattress. Something was wrapped around her throat. It looked like it was a pillowcase. Now, Barbara told reporters that Vanessa's skin tone matched the dull fatigue of the morning sky outside of her window. And by the touch, her skin had become as cold as the pane of glass that faced the winter chill. Now, picking up the baby from the sofa, Barbara raced into the hallway where she banged on a neighbor's door to use their phone. One look at the corpse when the officers got there, looking at the scene they knew. From hearing other stories from fellow police officers, they knew that the strangulation victims from previous murders, that this was the same killer or someone like him, and this person had struck again. Six foot tall, 200 pounds, and with a very pleasant face, 29-year-old Henry Lewis Wallace was outwardly a very likable person. He was chatty, bright, a go-getter, and smiled constantly. Except at certain times, like the night after Vanessa Mack's murder, when he sat down before his TV set, to situate himself to the dinnertime news report. He was nervous, but the smile quickly returned when the program ended and there had not been even the slightest reference to the latest strangling or to the manhunt that the police claim was in full vigor. He decided still to stay indoors that night for the same reason that he kept out of sight after all the other murders, just in case someone had seen his face or the cops were on the streets with a composite drawing of his face in their hands. He did feel remorse at what he'd done to Vanessa Mack. Damn it, he always felt remorse, but he figured it would wear away. It did all of the other times, after he had killed Hawk, Love, Stinson, all of them. Time heals like the cliche. It was true. Now, in the meantime, Sergeant McFadden was making attempts to tie together loose ends. His men were interrogating possible area suspects, those with violent past, who could move easily and unobserved among the black community where the crimes were being perpetrated. Detectives also reopened contact with the families and friends of all of the dead girls, hoping to find a continuous thread running through the case histories of the victims. Perhaps they hung out at a particular place where they might have come in contact with the killer. Perhaps they all worked together at one time or attended the same school. Maybe they had all befriended the same man, one particular individual with a criminal record. Nothing McFadden knew was beyond possibility. Now, as the investigation steamrolled forward, however, the killer struck twice in two successive nights. Victim number seven, Betty Bauckham. On March 9th, Betty Bauckham did not report to work at Bojangles restaurant where she served as assistant manager. Now, because it was the same restaurant on Central Avenue where Caroline Love had worked before she disappeared, the manager there became cautious. Of course, he called Betty at home and there was no answer. Now, throughout the night, he figured that Betty might appear with a reasonable explanation, but she never showed up. The next day, she was again scheduled to work, and she did not show up. Jeffrey called the police. Now, Betty was a reliable employee, and not showing up for work, especially two days in a row, was not in her nature. Police arrived, and they gained access into her apartment through the maintenance man on staff. Now, they discovered that Betty was fully clothed in her apartment, face down on the mattress. She was choked to death by a towel twisted into a noose around her neck. She was stone cold, having been dead more than 24 hours. Now this time, for the first time, the police believed that the murderer had left them something to go on, whereas the past victims' places of residence reflected only minor, if any, physical signs of disturbance. Betty's apartment had been noticeably ransacked a bare entertainment center and cable wires leading nowhere told them that there had been a TV 
and a VCR there, and they were missing. Betty's car was also gone from the building's parking lot. The police squad cars were alerted to look out for Betty's car. Now, simultaneously, investigators checked local pawn shops to see if someone had tried to exchange the stolen items from Betty's apartment for cash. Number eight, Brandy Henderson. Now, while the investigation of Betty Bauckham was going on, police were called out to the apartment of Brandy Henderson, whose boyfriend had just found her dead. When the police arrived there, they realized it was the same apartment complex where Betty Bauckham had just been found. More than that, this latest scene was pure chaos. It was the worst aftermath of the Strangler's attacks to date because this time he had assaulted a baby as well. The boyfriend who called the police, Vernes Lamar Woods, lived with Brandy Henderson. He had just come home from his job's night shift to find a ravaged apartment, his girlfriend dead in the bed with towels around her neck and their 10-month-old baby in his room barely alive. He was also strangled. A pair of shorts were tied around his neck. Now, when Vernes had found Brandy strangled and stiff, her face was a bluish tone. So he called 911. They told him to move her body from the bed to the floor and begin administering CPR. But according to the police officers, when they arrived, it was clear that Brandy was dead. An ambulance rushed the baby to the hospital, where at first the doctors feared that the baby had suffered smothering and that the smothering had caused brain damage. Luckily, the baby survived and tests indicated that he would recover without permanent injury. So during the second week of March in 1994, things began to break open as a sort of greed and gluttony overtook Henry Lewis Wallace. He went berserk and grew careless. The precautions he had previously taken to hide himself, like spacing out the murders, wiping off the fingerprints, even bathing some of the victims, were abandoned as he went on a joy ride of killing. And at this point, detectives could feel that their blood was boiling. Their commander, Gary McFadden, was on their backs. So they drew the squad together for a meeting to compare the notes they had made during their interviews with the deceased women's acquaintances. Now, the results of the reports were enlightening. They indicated that the girls did not seem to know each other, although some had crossed paths or that they never had worked together or went to school together. The clubs where they socialized were different. But when asked to list the names of the people with whom each victim associated, all of the interviewees mentioned in their list the same name, Henry Lewis Wallace. Of the slain women, both Shauna Hawk and Audrey Spain had at one time worked at Taco Bell, having the same manager, Henry Lewis Wallace. Valencia Jumper was a good friend of Henry's sister Yvonne. Michelle Stinson would often eat at the Taco Bell and chat with Henry. Vanessa Mack was the sister of one of Henry's ex-girlfriends. Betty Bauckham was a friend of Henry's current girlfriend. Brandy Henderson was the girlfriend of one of Henry's friends. Vernes Lamar Woods who found Brandy. In fact, Vernes had told the police that Henry often visited with Brandy while he was at work. Now, reaching back into the open case of the missing person, Caroline Love, detectives now realize that Caroline had also known Henry. She had been the roommate of his girlfriend, whom Henry visited regularly. The puzzle pieces were falling into place perfectly now. Now, when pulling a rap sheet on the sudden suspect, Mr. Henry Lewis Wallace, Sergeant McFadden was surprised to find that an outstanding warrant was already out for Henry for having failed to come to court on a recent larceny charge. When the police approached Henry's girlfriend, she was very taken aback, very surprised that her boyfriend Henry was suspected of being the Charlotte Strangler. But the more she thought about it, the more sense it made all along. Henry had been giving her presents, bracelets, rings, necklaces that sometimes seemed to be very familiar. In retrospect, she now realized that she had been wearing her dead friend's jewelry. But still, Gary McFadden wondered, is it all just a coincidence? So what, Henry knew the women, but would he have an alibi? Could it be proven that he had been 
with the victims on the nights they were killed. And then it came. The evidence that McFadden dreamed about. Betty Bacham's car was located, abandoned across town. Swipes of fingerprints found on the trunk lid matched Henry Lewis Wallace's. Police staked out Henry's residence throughout the evening of March 11th and the following day. However, officers had to track him down at a friend's house because he never showed up home. He was cuffed at approximately 5 p.m. on March the 12th. According to the report of arrest, Henry was sober. He was very calm and collected. He surrendered without a fight and he seemed a little wrinkled. Victim number nine, Deborah Slaughter. Now, while detectives were bringing in the strangler, Henry Lewis Wallace, another body had been found in Charlotte. Deborah Slaughter had been discovered that afternoon, raped, beaten, stabbed, and choked. A white linen shoved down her windpipe. The final victim, she too had been an intimate friend of Henry Lewis Wallace's. At the police station, Henry was led into an interview room where several detectives stood around a long bare table under fluorescent lighting. After introducing themselves to Henry, they asked him if he knew why he was there. At first, he alluded only to the larceny charge, but over the next several hours, these men would take turns interviewing him until he confessed to the killing of all nine of the Charlotte women, Caroline Love, Shauna Hawk, Audrey Spain, Valencia Jumper, Michelle Stinson, Vanessa Mack, Betty Bauckham, Brandy Henderson, and less than 48 hours before he was arrested, Deborah Slaughter. He also admitted murdering a prostitute whose name he never knew and whose body he concealed in a remote area not far from where he had dumped the cadaver of the missing person, Caroline Love. At approximately 10 p.m., after the initial interrogation, Henry was read his Miranda rights and then asked if he would agree to taping his confession. In no way was he coerced. He nodded and replied that having already admitted to what he had done, he said he felt like a big burden had been lifted. Speaking into a recording microphone, Henry led his listeners through many hours of sickening details. He verbally bought them from one murder scene to another, describing his thoughts as he killed the women, remembering their final words and actions, even their agony when he applied what he called the Boston Henry Wallace choke on them to render them powerless. Though he robbed most of his victims before he killed them, the underlining motive for the murders was not theft, but actually sex. Through the act of murder, he fulfilled his central fantasies of power and control. The thefts funded his crack habit, but the sex was the initiator. As the months progressed and he had been fired from one job after another, the only way that he knew how to quickly get cash for his drug habit was through his friends, unwillingly or otherwise. Robbing the women provided a more practical threshold to his more ultimate carnal desires. At one point during the interrogation, an investigator told Henry that he did not seem to be a bad guy by nature and asked him if he thought he might be schizophrenic. No, Henry answered. There's only one Henry, a bad Henry. Now, following our brief descriptions of what actually happened at the scenes of these murders, interspread with Henry Lewis Wallace's own chilling words. So the Caroline Love murder. Henry had taken a key to Caroline Love's apartment from his girlfriend and Caroline's roommate, Sadie McKnight. When he knew that Caroline would be alone, he entered into her apartment and hid in the bathroom for her to come home from work. When she arrived home, he told her that he wanted to make love. When she resisted, he put her in a wrestling hold. He said, I kept the hold on her until she passed out. And at that time, I moved her to her bedroom and removed her clothes and had intercourse with her. And at the same time, I was still applying the chokehold. She began to fidget. So I used a curling iron that was near her bed and I placed the cord around her neck. 
After she died, he folded the body in her bed sheets and placed the bundle in a large orange trash bag, kind of like the city workers used, he said. And then he carried the dead weight to his car. Returning to her apartment, he grabbed a roll of quarters that he saw lying on the dresser. Securing the body out of sight from passerbys, he drove to the city limits near a dark road, past some construction houses, and then dumped her body off on the side of the road where he thought it wouldn't be seen. He said about two days later, I went back and the body had almost decayed to the point where she looked just like a leather E.T. doll or something. Her body had decayed so bad. I went back about a week later and the only thing left then was bones. The Shauna Hawk murder. Now, at this time, Henry claimed that he had no intention of killing Shauna Hawk, but he had just merely stopped by to talk with her. She had just come in from school and her mother was not home. So the two of them shared idle chit chat for about an hour. She started teasing him, however, about a recent fight that he had with his girlfriend, Sadie McKnight. Her remarks got him upset and he said in his own words, that's when I rendered the chokehold on her until she passed out and then I filled the bathtub with water and placed her in it before he left he removed fifty dollars from her purse the Audrey Spain murder now Audrey Spain had just returned from vacation when Henry sought her out his excuse for visiting her was to share a joint together but he had another reason really and that was robbery after they finished smoking the joint he throttled her and pinned her to the floor he demanded to know how much money she had in the apartment and took what was available as he choked her she blacked out he stripped her dragged her to the bedroom and then he raped her his words were she was coming to and she begged me not to hurt her. So I just performed sex on her. And then I told her to stand and put her clothes on. And as she stood up to put her underwear on, that's when I administered the chokehold. Now, after she became limp in his arms, he tied a nightgown and a t-shirt together to strangle her with it. Upon leaving, he stole her Visa MasterCard and Exxon gas card using the cards to make several gas purchases. The Valencia Jumper murder. Now, Henry is quoted as saying, Valencia was like a little sister to me. I don't know why I ever hurt her. Nevertheless, he stopped by to see Valencia that night, telling her that he had had a fight with his girlfriend, Sadie, and badly needed someone to talk to. Valencia let him in. After they conversed a few moments, Henry asked her to please call Sadie to inform her that he was over there so she wouldn't wonder where he was at. When Valencia turned away from him to dial the phone, he threw her body into a lock. She begged me not to hurt her, he said. She said, I'll do anything you want me to, just don't hurt me. Fearfully, she allowed him to rape her. She even performed orally for him, hoping to save her life. While she was getting dressed afterwards, he managed to draw her attention to the other side of the room. He's quoted as saying, I put the towel around her neck and she just went out real quick. And I went to her kitchen and I noticed there was a bottle of rum, 151. And I poured the rum all over her body. And I went into the kitchen and opened a can of pork and beans. And I put it on the stove. I took the battery out of her smoke detector and I turned the stove on high. Then I went back into her bedroom and I took a match and I threw it on the 151. I left and went home. Before he lit her body on fire, he removed some expensive pieces of jewelry from her body. He later pawned them at the pawn shop. The Michelle Stinson murder. Henry dropped in unannounced on Michelle at 11 p.m. that night. His sole aim was to rape her. Chatting for a while, he pretended to be thirsty and asked for a glass of water. Watching Michelle turn to reach for the glass on the shelf, he made his move. Immobilizing her from behind, he began to unbutton her blouse. After forcing her into sex, he choked her until she passed out. I went to the bathroom and I got a towel. I put it around her neck and I strangled her. But she kept moaning and groaning and so forth and so on. So there was a knife in her kitchen and I think I stabbed her about four times. The Vanessa Mack murder. 
Now, by the time he killed Vanessa Mack, he admitted that his primary motive was money. Such was his drug addiction. He was on crack, LSD, anything that he can get his hands on, he was taken. Any way that he could get it, he was doing it. So Vanessa, he knew, had a good job, money in the bank, and she always had an ATM card. So that night, he carried a pillowcase hidden in his jacket. He said, she stood up to get me some soda in the kitchen. That's when I quickly put the pillowcase around her neck, and I asked her for all of the money she had because she told me she had just gotten an income tax return. I asked her for her teller card and the PIN number. After she turned those things over to me, he insisted on having sex. She was too afraid to object. When they were through, she mentioned that she needed to put her baby to bed. The child had been asleep on the couch. He pretended to release her from his grasp, but as she rose off the mattress, he reached around her once more with the pillowcase and ended her life. Later that evening, when using her ATM card, it did not work. He said she had given me some fake PIN number. The Betty Bauckham murder. Now, since Betty Bauckham was the one of the supervisors that worked at Bojangles restaurant, Henry figured that she knew the burglar alarm to the restaurant and that she also possessed the keys to the safe. His intention was wholly theft. He stopped by and asked her if he could use the phone and she allowed him to. She opened her door to him. He dawdled around for a few moments on the phone, pretending to be looking up a certain number. When she turned her back, he subdued her. Ordering her to get naked, she resisted. Fighting, she inflicted scratches and a bite mark on his shoulder. Overcoming her at last, he angrily raped her. He said, then I told her to get up, put her clothes on. I placed the towel around her neck and asked her if she had any money. She said, yes, yeah, she did. She gave me the money that was in her purse. I took a gold chain from around her neck. With that done, he strangled her. Now, not satisfied with that evening's take, he decided to steal her TV set and VCR. But since he no longer had a car because he had just wrecked his green Maxima, he took her car to transport the items back to his apartment. Now, from there, he sold them for cash. Fearing that the police might be catching on, he abandoned the car hours later, wiping it clean of fingerprints. But he confessed that he had forgotten to wipe off the trunk lid. And we know that's how he was caught. The Brandy Henderson murder. Now, after leaving Betty Bauckham's apartment, he stepped down the hall straight to Brandy Henderson's apartment, where he knew that she would be home alone because his friend, Verness Lamar Woods, was working and he knew this so he knocked on the door told brandy that he wanted to drop something off for lamar so she let him in she suspected nothing once inside he squeezed her to him and demanded money the only cash she had on hand was 15 dollars in her purse and some loose change that she kept in a pringles jar now taking that he led her to the bed where he commanded her to perform oral sex on him. The more she pleaded, the more aroused he said he became. He said, we had intercourse and afterwards she got on her knees and started praying because she was scared. And I said, I'm not gonna hurt you. I said, give me a hug. And she hugged me, but I choked her out with a towel until she was red in the face and unconscious. She died in his grasp. Henry had intended to steal Brandy's TV and stereo since he had use of her car. But when her baby began crying, Henry got scared. The last thing he wanted now was an angry neighbor waking up just as he was carrying stolen merchandise from her apartment. So lifting the baby from the crib, Henry tried to calm the baby down with a pacifier, but it was not working. He said, I took a towel and placed it around the baby's neck and I didn't want to tie it tight enough to choke him, just enough to make it difficult for him to breathe. His crying sputtered, which afforded Henry the quiet that he needed to get out of the apartment with the items not being interrupted. The Deborah Slaughter murder. Approaching Deborah Slaughter at her apartment, Henry asked if she wanted to go in on him 
with a purchase of cocaine. She told him that she didn't have enough money for that and disappointed, he hit her and in his customary manner, Strong held her with a towel around her throat. Forcing sex on her, he also made her give him $60 in cash that she had. But Deborah proved to be more obstinate than the other women Henry had encountered. Much more. She raged, she got mad, she started screaming, and she told him that her suspicions of him were now confirmed. That he was the man who had been strangling all those women across that part of Charlotte. He denied it, but she only became more louder. When he reached to strike her, she got free. She screamed, called out for the police, and reached for a knife that she had hidden in her purse. Henry said, I caught her arm and I grabbed the knife from her and I stabbed her about 20 times. It was a little knife shaped kind of like a dagger. After he killed her, he left to buy some crack. But I went back to her apartment while she lay on the floor dead. I went in her bathroom and I smoked it. Henry also admitted to having killed a prostitute whose name he did not know back in 1992, but said that in that case, she had been the aggressor. We had sexual intercourse. She demanded money and I didn't have any money. And we got into a scuffle and it pursued into basically me beating her to death. Stuffing her body in his car, he drove it to a deserted area near railroad tracks and abandoned it out of sight. Now, the confession phase having ended, the investigator asked Henry Wallace, why have you told us what you've told us? Henry said, I wanted to tell the story for a long time. If I wouldn't have told you, if I wouldn't have stopped, the killing would have continued and probably I would have killed myself as well. I've tried many times, but was unsuccessful. Over the next couple of weeks, detectives followed up on Henry's claims, names, dates, and times. They accompanied him to the spot where Caroline Love had been left. From her remains, a pathologist was able to confirm that Caroline had been strangled. On April 4th of 1994, Henry Wallace was officially indicted with nine counts of murder, as well as a slew of of other charges, various counts of first and second degree rape, various counts of first and second degree sexual offense, various counts of assault with a deadly weapon, assault on a child under the age of 12, and several counts of robbery with a dangerous weapon. Suddenly, in November of 1994, eight months after Henry Lewis Wallace confessed to his crimes, he filed a motion to suppress the interviews. His claim was that he was coerced into making the confession. A hearing was scheduled to review his motion, which threw the court trial schedule into confusion. His trial date needed to be postponed pending further investigation. Now, examiners studied the case and in April of 1995 announced their findings. Henry's argument rested chiefly on the objection that he was not administered the Miranda rights until 10 p.m., more than three hours into his interview the night of March 12, 1994. According to the published report, however, the attending officers who met with Henry spent the earlier part of that night casually questioning him about his larceny charge, his drug habit, and his whereabouts at the time, the Charlotte women were strangled. He was charged only after the detectives felt that there was enough suspicion warranting a charge and before he taped his official statement of confession. At that time, the detectives advised Henry of his Miranda rights, which Henry said he understood and chose to waive. Officers had not asked questions that would elicit an incriminating response. As well, Henry had been given refreshments and snacks and allowed to take appropriate rest breaks. He was not brutalized, threatened, or in any way pushed into a predicament where he might have felt compelled to fear for his life unless he responded in a pre-designated fashion. Once Henry began confessing, he continued to take breaks, continued to be fed on a regular basis, and was given duration to sleep. According to the tape transcript, 
there is evidence throughout that Henry was speaking at his own will, at random and at his own pace. His tone was neither forced nor frightened. Henry's motion also cited that he was induced to confessing by a promise from the detectives to let him visit with his daughter Kendra and his girlfriend Sadie McKnight. The interrogation team denied this accusation, explaining that Kendra and Sadie's names came up after Henry had already agreed to talk. The transcript from the interrogation supported the team's explanation in the following dialogue between the detectives and Henry Wallace. Detective Sanders said, has anybody threatened you or Wallace says, no. Detective Sanders says, have they coerced you or made you any special promises? Wallace says, no, I just want, I just want an opportunity to maybe for the last time to hold my daughter. I'd like to say goodbye to Sadie. I really can't speak with my family right now. I think I've caused them enough problems in my lifetime. My mother did the best job she could to raise me. Detective Sanders says, you've asked, and I want to clarify, that you've asked us to see if we can arrange for you to see Sadie and your daughter, and we've said that we will try to do that. Wallace answers, yes. Detective Sanders says, but aside from that, was that an exchange for you talking to us? Wallace says, was that an exchange? Sanders says, yes. Wallace says, it was a condition. I wouldn't necessarily say it was an exchange. I wanted, like I said, for the last time to say goodbye to those people. Detective Sanders says, do you feel like we've used that to get you to talk to us? And Wallace says, no, no, I mean, I hope not anyway. I mean, I don't feel that way. A third charge alleged by Henry concerned the delay in presenting him before a magistrate. He was brought before magistrate Karen Johnson, who came to the detention center where Henry was just before noon on March 13th, the morning following his confession. Now, Henry challenged that had he been taken before a magistrate earlier, he might not have felt coerced and therefore obliged to confess. The police stated that the delay was due to the fact that the transcripts of the confession required time to be made and that Henry needed time to sleep, which he did from 7.30 a.m. to almost noon of the 13th. After his appearance before the judge, he continued to talk openly and without hesitation about his crimes. The hearing concluded that, number one, Henry had been given the Miranda rights in due and proper time. Number two, that he had made his confession voluntarily without any trickery from the police. And three, that the delay in bringing him before a magistrate was not based on any off-handed motivation by the police. Now, Henry Lewis Wallace's mother, Lottie, could not believe that her son was arrested and accused of such horrible crimes. On March 16th of 1994, she told reporters that she felt like she was dreaming, having gotten little to no sleep since finding out that her son was a serial killer. She said, it's like you're in a dream and you're eventually going to wake up. That's how it seems to me. You don't know what your children are doing, so what can you say? She said her son had offered little explanation in the two phone conversations they had since he was charged. She said that Henry had told her it was something that happened in his head and he couldn't explain it. He said he hoped that nobody thought that she did a bad job raising him. Now, at that time, Henry had also confessed to sexually assaulting and strangling an 11th person, 17-year-old Tashanda Bethea in March of 1990. Now, Tashanda had lived with her aunt and uncle in the same Barnwell neighborhood as the Wallace family. Henry had wanted to confess to Tashanda's killing because he said he knew her family. Tashanda's aunt went to see Henry's mother, saying that she did not blame her for what her son had done. Henry's sister Yvonne 
said that her mother remembered the younger Henry and did not understand what had gone wrong with him. How he could have done the things that he did. The sister of another slain woman called Yvonne Wallace in search of an answer. But Yvonne said she had nothing to say. We feel sorry for them that these things have happened. Those lives didn't have to be taken. Charlotte police apologized for not spotting a link between the murders sooner. Police chief Jack Boger rejected accusations by some that the investigation was slow because of the victims being working class blacks. He said, if somebody could show me evidence of a pattern of discrimination, I'd certainly do something to fix that. I don't believe it would have been any different if the victims had been 10 middle class white women. Police say they were thrown off Wallace's trail by variations in the cases. Henry gave few clues to his friends and family that something was wrong. And despite Henry's frequent calls and visits, his family said they learned just last month that he had a problem with crack cocaine. They learned of his arrest through news reports. So they did not know what Henry was up to in his life. He would rather have died than for me to find out. Every time he's done something, I was the last to find out about it, Henry's mother said. She said that Henry told her he felt relieved after he was taken into custody. The sheriff said that during their interview, Henry calmly ate a Snickers candy bar and drank a Coke as he gave detailed information about how he destroyed the evidence of Tashonda Bethea's death. It was just like something you do every day. No big deal. He seemed like a super nice guy, but he's got a bad ticker somewhere, the sheriff said. Now, Henry's father was not able to learn of his son's crimes because he had been dead for years with their mother just learning of his death. And Henry's mother actually didn't even go to the jail to see Henry. She said, he hurt me and I just don't want to see him right now. I'd be afraid I'd say something I shouldn't say. Henry's trial for murder lasted nearly four months. The court convened in September of 1996, and it concluded in late January of 1997 with the jury's judgment of death for all nine murders. Heading the prosecution was Mecklenburg's tough female prosecutor, Ann Tompkins. She was fresh from her victory in sending high-profile child killer Fred Coffey to prison for life. Now, public defender Isabel Scott Day was serving as Henry Wallace's chief attorney. Now, Day's professional history included a woman that she once defended who was charged with stealing meat in a grocery store. When asked why she did it, the woman said she never tasted steak before. Day handed the woman the money to buy some steak. And when speaking on her defense of Henry Wallace, she said, all I can do is care about him as a human being. I did not see in him the monster that other people saw. For day defending Henry Wallace was an uphill battle, never a break. It was a tiring task, and she had expected it to be. After her failed attempts to suppress his confession statement, there was little she could do but fight to save him from death. Henry's legal team's strategy was to cast a doubt in the jury's mind as to Henry's sanity. Two impressive witnesses for the defense included a pair of experts on the subject of serial killings and a specialist in the psychosocial development. The expert witness testified that he believed Henry's actions displayed both organizational and disorganizational characteristics, which meant that Henry exhibited signs of psychological instability. It was further presented on the witness stands by the doctors that Henry was unable to separate reality from fantasy, thus suffering from mental illness. But the jury was unmoved. They were not buying it. The defense could not weaken the impression made by the state with its long line of official witnesses who talked about the fingerprints on Betty Bacham's car, who played back the tape of Henry's confession, who recalled Brandy Henderson's 10-month-old baby boy who was almost strangled to death and who described in detail the ghastly expressions on the dead girl's faces. On January 7, 1997, the 12 jurors found 
Henry Wallace guilty of nine counts of first degree murder, each on the basis of malice, premeditation, and deliberation. Three weeks later, on January 29th, the jury likewise ruled that Henry Wallace should pay for his crimes with his life. The judge's declaration of nine death sentences included in the punishment penalties for rape and other charges for which he was convicted. Henry Wallace produced a handwritten statement that he had read in court to the families of the deceased, and in the statement, Henry conceded to the horror that he created, but asked that the families forgive him. Here are the words from his handwritten statement. This is probably one of the hardest things I've ever had to say in my life. To the families of Caroline Love, Shauna Hawk, Audrey Smith, Valencia Jumper, Michelle Stinson, Vanessa Mack, Betty Bauckham, Brandy Henderson, Deborah Slaughter, what words in any language can I say that will bring you comfort, quiet the storm, or release you from the mental prison I have put you in? I'm sorry. I apologize. I didn't mean to do it. I profess that all of these words and all that I know fall for short of what's needed to console any of you. I know that it is hard to believe, or you may have not chose to believe, but I suffer a great loss with each and every one of you. I've lost a sister, a partner, a princess, and several friends. I too suffer losses that are senseless. I want to say here and now, none of these women, none of your daughters, mothers, sisters, or family members in any way deserve what they got. They did nothing to me that warranted their death. If giving my life will bring them back, one or all, I would gladly and without hesitation lie down and die for them. If I thought for one minute that dying, it would bring you closer to your loss or free you from the mental prison, then again, I'd give my life for you. A million words could never express the words I wanted to say, but please allow these few to sink in and touch your hearts because they are from mine. I am sorry. I am so sorry. Please, I beg of you in the name of Jesus, please forgive me. I wish I would have seen then and knew then what I see now and know now. I wish I would have gotten help then so we wouldn't be here now. I come to each and every one of you to ask for something. One of the most difficult things in this world to give. I'm asking for your forgiveness. If I could change the world and take away the bad that's in it, I would. If I could turn back the hands of time, I would. I confess not only to stop the insanity, but because God told me, that you, the families, deserved and wanted to know the truth. The truth shall set you free. Right now, I am freer than I've ever been in my entire life. I'm free on the inside. When God gives us burdens, he gives us grace to bear them. I hope you will forgive me. I asked for God's forgiveness, and he gave it to me. For when God says, I forgive, it should change the way we live. May God bless you, keep you, guide you, and protect you. In the name of Jesus, love, Henry L. Wallace. Now, quoting the book of Mark from the Bible, he prayed these words. And when you stand praying, forgive if you have nothing against anyone. Then your father also, which is in heaven, will forgive you and your trespasses. According to witnesses that was in that courtroom, the families who were there they did not believe a word that he said. Kathy Love, the sister of victim Caroline Love, told a reporter that she didn't buy it. I don't believe he's sorry. He wouldn't have lied to me for two years while my sister was missing and then killed all those other women. Her sentiments reflected those of the other relatives that were also present. Brandy Henderson's cousin, George Burrell, when asked what he thought, merely shook his head and simply wanted to know what made Henry do what he'd done. Henry's attorney's explanation to that was that Henry was very sick and was very mentally ill. Now, Henry's attorney, she cried once this trial was over. She cried heavily, not for the loss in court, but because the high emotion that she had to hold back over all those months of the trial, she could finally release that. After his trial, Henry Louis Wallace was transferred to North Carolina's 
only death row unit in central prison rally and his verdict was automatically of course appealed the appeal was complex but it basically resurrected the same earlier issues that henry lewis wallace was involuntarily made to confess the delay of the issuance of his miranda rights was an issue and they contested some new things as well the possible illegality of the court's refusal to accept the defense's motion for change of venue to a less prejudicial locality and even the definitions of premeditation and deliberation as they applied to Henry's crimes were in question. On May 5th of 2000, the Supreme Court of North Carolina filed its response. We conclude defendant received a fair trial and capital sentencing proceeding free from judicial error and the sentences of death recommended by the jury and entered by the trial court are not disproportionate. Now for a man whose appeal cited coerced confessions, Henry Wallace kept talking, 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 as if to dump all the guilt from every dark corner of his body. Even before his trial, Henry confessed to other murders for which he was not even charged. Besides the prostitute that he admitted killing in Charlotte, he also claimed to have killed while in the Navy a woman named Tashonda Bethea in South Carolina in 1990. And there were more. After his incarceration, he told authorities of others. Now, if all true, the estimated number nears 20, all murdered across the world while he was on naval duty in various ports of call. Now, in the meantime, Henry Wallace sits in Central Prison, a three-hour drive from Charlotte, North Carolina. He is separated from other unit prisoners who drew him into fights the minute he got there. But now some of those who at first picked on him might think differently because when he first got there, he was 180 pounds. Now he weighs in about 400. Now all prison time has not been downcast for Henry Wallace. He married prison nurse Rebecca Torres on June 5th of 1998. The vows being exchanged in a small room next to the death chamber. Now, although they were never allowed to consummate their marriage, the couple remains in communication. Rebecca is a constant visitor. But the memory of the wedding day almost assuredly lightens his daily load. If by chance he happens to glance down that quarter where the death chamber sits, he probably remembers his wedding ceremony instead of the day that he's going to die in that death chamber. So you guys drop down in the comment section below and let me know what your thoughts are on this case. I would like to send my condolences out to the families, the victims that suffered at the hands of this man. He was pure evil. Now, I do get the argument that he was emotionally neglected. He grew up in a bad environment. He had a terrible childhood. I mean, having to whip his sister, they had to pick out their own switches. But, you know, people have suffered those fates and they don't grow up to be serial killers. So um, the fact that he had the audacity to stand up in court and read that letter and say that he suffered losses as well um, your losses do not compare to the loss of life um, that you inflicted on 9 11 20 families I mean the women that you say you killed their families people that you haven't even been charged with the murders of you have inflicted pain on people people's family members are missing that they never got a chance to bury them they don't even know where they are to this day some of them probably died not knowing what happened to their family members so the fact that he stood up and gave that speech with that letter was horrible i don't even think he should have been allowed to issue such a statement but i get it everyone has freedom of speech so you guys drop down in the comments and let me know what you think about this video as always please be sure to like the video share the video but most importantly be sure to subscribe to the channel and i'll catch you on the next one bye guys